example, which I want to discuss a bit more in detail, and um, which we've actually published um, last year, concerns a manuscript fragment which has puzzled our um, scholars at the museum for quite some time, um, because they haven't been able to attribute it not only to an artist, but not, not even to a school, not even to a specific city. Um, they, they even wonder if it might be a fake at some point, because they just couldn't place it. Um, stylistically is closest to the manuscripts produced in Rome and Bologna around 1500, but um, it's quite unique. It's beautiful, but it, it doesn't look like anything anybody had seen before. We were asked to analyze it just to learn more about it in general, um, and sort of with the secret hope <laughs> that we could maybe help. First of all, make sure it wasn't a fake, um, and maybe help put it in context um, a little bit more. So we did a bit of um, site-specific analysis, and then we did a, a macro XRX scan. It was really interesting because, um, for example, it helped us understand better the copper green pigment that we were looking at. So what you see here is um, copper in blue and zinc in green, and the cyan areas are the areas where the two copper and zinc coexist. And what is interesting to see is that zinc is only present in copper green areas, not in copper blue areas. Um, so that tells us two things. First, that the green wasn't obtained by mixing asherite, a copper blue, with a yellow <coughs> pigment, because otherwise we'd see the impurity in both. Um, and mixing blue and yellow is something that Italian illuminators did quite a bit at that time. So this is a good piece of information. Um, it's definitely a different copper pigment. Um, the fact that there is zinc in the copper green could um, tell us a couple of things. Could be, um, it could be indicative of the presence of rosacite, which is a copper zinc uh, carbonate. It's a mineral that is often found with malachite in um, copper deposits. It could also, if it's an artificial synthetic green pigment, it could mean that brass was used as the raw material. Um, so we still have two possibilities. We still don't, can't know exactly what type of copper green we're looking at. Thankfully, although noisy, we did obtain maps for arsenic and antimony, which are both also um, common impurities in malachite, and they match the map to the copper green area. The co-presence, I guess, of copper and zinc, um, antimony and arsenic in the green area is a really good indication that it is of malachite type pigment and mineral um, copper green. Another thing that the elemental maps told us, which we hadn't noticed before, <laughs> was, the, um, um, was about the use, different use of blues. So we had noticed that lapis lazuli um, was used in the miniature, and you see that the red um, areas, um, red is the the potassium map, so we're using that to map lapis because the silicon and aluminum maps are just too noisy and not reliable enough. So we could see that the blue in the miniature was lapis, and then the blue used for the leaves in the initial and in the border was asherite. What we hadn't realized, or what I hadn't realized, was that the dark blue <coughs> um, used to outline all the decoration <coughs> and uh, the leaves is actually <coughs> lapis. Those are the magenta areas in the map, so areas where we see both copper and potassium because you've got lapis on top of asherite, so you're seeing both elements. Um, so this was really nice, because we had an, in small areas, so we wouldn't necessarily go and analyze them specifically. You'd have to be doing XRF a really low energy in order to pick up the lapis on top of the, of the copper. So unless you're looking for it, you don't find it, basically, unless you've got a map. <laughs> um, so this was, really, um, was a really nice result, actually, um, that we got from the maps. And lastly, for me, the most interesting um, result about this object was the fact that we were able to prove the um, use of manganese oxide, um, manganese black, as a pigment. Now, the problem with manganese is that, as you probably know, there's always traces of, or often traces of manganese in earth pigments. Um, so we'd seen manganese in the individual spectra in brown and gray areas, but we just thought, okay, so it's an earth or a number, or an earth with a bit of manganese. But then when we looked at the maps for manganese and iron, we realized they didn't match at all. So manganese is not present in areas where the iron is, so it's definitely not an impurity in the iron pigments, in the earth pigments. It's used as a pigment in um, right, it's manganese black. It's interesting from a scientific point of view, I think. It's a really good use of the method. Um, but it's also interesting, actually, from the point of view of the context of this object, which is what we were really trying to nail down. Um, because research carried out in the last 15 years or so, mostly here at the National Gallery, um, but then with the input of um, colleagues at the V&A and the Getty in terms of the illuminations, not the panel paintings, 
has shown that around um, 1500, beginning of the 16th century, there's a group of mostly Italian painters and a few French ones, which use some unusual black pigments, including manganese black manganese oxide. Now, first we know the identification of manganese black in this miniature is, is the first time it's been found in a miniature for sure. Um, and uh, um, the interesting thing is that although it doesn't help us say this miniature was painted definitely in Rome or in Bologna, it does absolutely support that as the, the first of all, the dating, because these pigments were used for a relatively short period of time. And, and also the, the artistic milieu, because the pigments were used by artists working in central and northern Italy at that time. So um, it strongly supports the fact that this miniature was produced in that specific context, which, again, it's not a definitive result, but um, my art historian colleagues were really happy to hear that. Um, because, again, um, yeah, because of the lack of context. For, for this fragment. This miniature had one last surprise in store for us. We could tell from X-ray, the x map, that an arsenic sulfide pigment had been used for a lot of the sort of ochre yellow areas. And that's, to be honest, that's as far as x could take us. Um, we couldn't tell what kind of arsenic sulfide pigment it was. Um, but we were lucky enough to have um, team pigment from the University of Durham with their portable Raman spectrometer. They came over, <coughs> did some analysis for us. And, um, and they, we identified um, what some people call artificial ore pigment. It's an arsenic sulfide glass, which has only been recently identified securely on painted objects. Um, we've identified it on this fragment and on another manuscript painted at just about the same time by an Italian artist in France. These are the only two manuscripts I've ever seen it um, on. Um, and we're hoping that by analyzing more manuscripts, this might again become a way to um, help us with context. Because it is a relatively unusual pigment, and it, it's possible that it might, its use might also be sort of localized geographically and chronologically like the, the unusual blanks. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, in the next few years, we find arsenic sulfide, you know, arsenic sulfide glass, please let us know. Because <laughs> um, it'd be really, really good um, to be able to say more about this sort of unusual um, pigment.